Hi, my name is David Merrill. Uh, I am a emeritus professor at Utah State University. Uh, the purpose of this short video uh, is to introduce my new book, The First Principles of Instruction, that will be published by Pfeiffer uh, in 2012. Uh, I've been working on uh, trying to identify those principles which make for effective, efficient, and engaging instruction for about the past 10 years. This book represents a culmination of my efforts and an attempt to uh, try to help people understand uh, and apply first principles of instruction. This new book, First Principles of Instruction, really has two main parts, which we have designated here as finding and designing E to the third power instruction. E to the third power means effective, efficient, and engaging instruction. And in the first half of the book, we try to present that kind of theory which would enable us to uh, carefully identify effective instruction when we find it. In the second half of the book, we try to implement the pebble in the pond model of instructional design for designing a first principle instruction based on first principles. This diagram <laughs> represents the overview of the first half of the book. I will briefly explain the organization and a little bit about the theory that underlies this book. The uh, first chapter in the book, not designated on this diagram, indicates some of the problems we have in current instruction. The second chapter of the book, titled The First Principles of Instruction, outlines the first principles as we have identified them. There are five main principles uh, which we designate as activation, demonstration, application, integration, and problem-centered. Uh, these are the principles which uh, this book e elaborates in some detail. The Starting in Chapter 3, we lay a foundation for first principles. If we're going to discuss instruction in detail, we need to have a way to describe that instruction. Chapter 3, which is labeled Instructional Content, identifies five types of skill, information about, parts of, kind of, how to, and what happens. And it also ind indicates some of the um, elements, content elements, that are associated with each of these kinds of skill. These elements can be represented at two levels, both an information level, that is, that's a general level, the, uh, and a portrayal level, which is the specific level or the example level. This chapter then elaborates and illustrates this way of describing instructional content. Chapter 4 talks about instructional interactions. We have identified four primary interaction modes, tell, show, ask, and do. It seems that almost all instruction can be either presented to the student, they can show examples, uh, we can ask people to remember the uh, information, or we can ask them to apply that information to solving problems. So when we use these words, tell, show, ask, and do, we're using them very specifically in this book. Uh, this chapter describes, defines, and illustrates these primary interaction modes, these four interaction modes. In addition, we talk about multimedia, presiding feedback, providing guidance and coaching, and the idea that we need to have more than a single example if people are going to really learn effective instruction. Chapter uh, 5 is a very important uh, chapter in this book in that it brings together the five types of instructional outcomes it, and the, the uh, interaction modes, tell, ask, show, and do. And then in the cells of this matrix, it indicates those content elements which are told or asked or shown. Uh, and so each of these lines, each of these rows, represents those instructional events which comprise an instructional strategy for a particular kind of instructional outcome. This chapter takes each of these five 
different types of, of learning outcomes, types of skill, and describes in some detail the effective instructional strategies that might facilitate learners to effectively and efficiently gain that particular skill. The problem solving strat chapter in chapter 6 is probably the most significant chapter in this book. It represents new information that I have not previously published and is an attempt to show that all of these component skills uh, come together to form uh, a, a composite or a, comp a compound strategy for teaching whole problems. So in this particular example we have uh, what happens which is a set of conditions leading to a consequence. We have a set of steps which lead to these conditions and we have properties that define the conditions or define the steps. The conditions leading to a consequence represent what happens. The steps that create or, or lead to the conditions are how to and identifying a condition or a step by a set of properties is a kind of. So this diagram for a whole problem brings together what happens, how to, and kind of all in a single uh, integrated strategy for teaching whole problems. We then move to a chapter where we talk about the difference between traditional curriculum which is represented by this diagram in which we present a series of uh, information, we present some practice or test, uh, some more information for a given topic. We repeat that for a second topic and for a third topic and so forth until we've presented all of the topics that we want to teach. And finally, usually at the end, toward the end of the course, students are asked to we'll put this all together into some form of final project. This is a typical traditional curriculum. In first principles we introduce a different type of instructional curriculums for teaching problems in which we use a progression of problems. Number one indicates here that we show a whole problem uh, and then once we have demonstrated that problem we indicate and teach the component skills which are necessary to solve that problem. We don't teach everything about each component skill, only those parts that are necessary to solve the problem. We then show how those component skills are applied or are in indicated in that first problem. We then move in number four to a second whole problem. We first ask students to apply those things which they already know. This is number five and then we present additional details for each of the component skills that might be required for this second problem. This process is repeated for a third problem, for a fourth problem, and finally after all of the details of each component skill have been uh, demonstrated and applied by students, we have students solve a, a new problem without assistance. In this approach there is a progression then of portrayals of a given type of problem until the student has sufficiently mastered the content for that problem. There are several other chapters that I won't go into detail here in the first part of this book. One deals with peer interaction, how do students interact with each other in an effective way. A, another one deals with structural frameworks, sometimes called advanced organizers. How do we activate what students already know and use that to create new information? And finally, of course, in this day and age, we need to be concerned with how we implement these instructional strategies using media. This first section of this book ends up with a course critique checklist. This is a checklist of all of the content theory, the interaction theory, the strategies, uh, that you can use to evaluate a given piece of instruction. This kind of represents the overview of the first part of this book. The second part of First Principles of Instruction deals with the pebble in the pond approach to instructional design. This diagram 
as in chapter 11, is the overview of the pebble in the pond approach. The pebble in the pond differs from traditional instructional design in that it is a problem-centered approach. It is a content-first approach. It promotes developing functional prototypes rather than instructional design specifications. Uh, and it moves in a somewhat different way. It still, however, implements uh, analysis and, uh, and design uh, and development, uh, the typical uh, ADI model of instructional design, but in a different way. Let me briefly overview uh, the second half of this book and uh, the Pebble model for designing instruction. The first thing we're concerned with is how to design a problem prototype. This diagram is far too complex for this particular video, but what it basically illustrates is a sample course on photographic composition. And this is a different representation of the diagram we saw representing the steps, conditions, properties, and consequence of a whole problem. So this is a way to analyze a whole problem to see all of the component pieces that are involved in that problem. We then design a, a demonstration and an application for an instance for a, a portrayal of this problem. That's the first step. So rather than specifying an instructional objective, which tends to be abstract, we actually identify a typical problem that the students would be able to solve. We, we develop a presentation or demonstration of that problem and we use that same problem to uh, create an application that would require the students to apply what they know to solve that problem. In this particular case, the problem was how to, uh, create, how to take and, and create uh, photographs which use effective photographic composition. The second part of the second step in the Pebble model is to develop a progression of problems. Rather than teaching all of the topics and having a problem at the end, as we illustrated for a traditional curriculum, in the first principles approach, we try to identify a whole series of problems. This particular diagram represents a series of photographs that try to illustrate or which can be used to illustrate photographic composition. What we have done in this particular analysis uh, is to identify the uh, conditions for each of these photographs down the left hand side. Simplicity, rule of thirds, format, frame, line are all conditions which create or help create an effective photographic composition. The X's in the cells indicate which of those conditions a particular photograph in our progression of photographs represents. The four items below that, pose, viewfinder, crop, and edit, are steps that a student could take or have or the, a photographer has taken to create the effective photograph. If an X appears, it means that this photograph illustrates that that step has been taken. If there is a question mark there, it means that either the condition could be created by editing or cropping, uh, and the question below indicates that this photograph could be fixed uh, by these, uh, the, these taking one of these steps. So by laying out our entire set of problems here across the top and indicating which conditions and which steps are involved, we can create a sequence of problems from simple to the most complex. And we will use that sequence then to teach uh, the, the skills that we want students to have as we move through this progression of problems. We try to arrange this progression in such a way that by the time we have finished, students will have acquired all of the skills. You will note in the last column, there's a question mark in each of the each of several of these conditions and steps indicating that this photograph could be improved uh, and will be improved as an application of what the student has learned about photographic composition. I hope that you can see that 
any kind of problems could be put into a sequence of this type and that the idea is to start with the problems and then figure out what it is the skills that students need and then sequence those into a problem progression. Finally, once we have the problem progression, we want to develop component skills. So in this case, what we want to do is to create a presentation, a set of instructional events which will enable uh, this student to acquire the skills. In our, comp in our photographic composition, uh, this particular uh, slide uh, illustrates pose, viewfinder, and rule of thirds. I wanted to uh, show this my particular subject slide also involved uh, is model animated railroad. with a demonstration. Candid photos are fun and sometimes really capture the action of the story you want to tell. However, you usually have more control over the photograph if you compose your subject. For this photograph, I tried several different poses. In this pose, there are really two subjects, the operator and his train. They compete for your attention. The background in this photograph is also distracting. I decided to try another pose. In this pose, I looked more carefully through my viewfinder to try to eliminate the distracting background. I think that it is better than my first pose. However, my intent was to photograph the owner of the model railroad, not the railroad itself. In this pose, the train is the primary subject of the photograph, and we only see the back of the operator's head. I felt I needed a different pose to better capture the involvement of my intended subject. I tried a different pose by having the owner make a repair on his railroad rather than running a train. This eliminated the train as a competing subject of the photograph. By carefully adjusting what I could see through the viewfinder, I was better able to capture the concentration on the subject's face as he made his repair. His gaze also directed my view to his hands, which are making the repair. This provided a more dynamic feeling in this photograph. This pose also better implements the rule of thirds. Note that the face of the subject is at the upper right intersection of the lines that divide the photograph into thirds horizontally and vertically. In addition, his hands are at the lower left intersection of these lines. Implementing the rule of thirds improves the composition of this photograph. I hope that by showing that example you can see that after we have a progression we go back and teach each of the component skills. That was one slide to teach some of the component skills involved in photographic composition. Once we have developed a problem and a demonstration and application of that problem, we've identified a progression of problems and, and we have created either demonstrations or applications for each of the problems in that progression and then we have created additional instruction to teach the component skills necessary to solve the problem. The next thing we can do is enhance our strategies by using either uh, some kind of uh, structural uh, framework. Uh, in the case of our uh, photograph, the structural framework that we used here was to uh, indicate that the purpose of composition was to funnel the site so we kind of use this metaphor of a funnel to help people understand. We also wanted to have uh, something to, that would enable students to interact with each other uh, to try to get integration uh, and we found that student collaboration or uh, critique is very helpful and so in this case we showed some other photographs which were somewhat different and asked the students to have a discussion about these photographs to see if they could identify what the, the rules of composition, how they applied to these portraits. Finally, uh, we finalize the design. There are a number of things we can do to finalize the design. One of the things that we can do is to create a layout for the whole course so that students can see where everything is. In our photography course, we did this by using the same diagram we used to kind of show our progression. The buttons here underneath each picture are where that particular uh, condition listed on the right, simple rule of thirds, etc., is explained, uh, and or where the step viewfinder, crop, edit is demonstrated. So this also serves as kind of a content-oriented navigation tool 
for purposes of review so that students can go back and review any particular part of the of the course. Uh, another thing that we wanted to do was to provide some kind of a checklist, uh, some kind of a, a guide for students to use uh, in the future. So we created this kind of checklist for good photographic composition using some of the photographs from our from our lesson and the demonst the definition of each of the pieces of information for each of the component skills. We created this checklist to try to help students. Uh, is they took additional photographs. We also of course added uh, checked on navigation, we checked on the layout, we checked on the appearance. All of those things are necessary to finalize a, a particular course uh, and so those are some of those items are identified in this chapter on finalizing. And finally it's important that we evaluate our course so one of the things we want to do is to go through and make sure that we have created assessment opportunities. Uh, this is an assessment opportunity that allows students to uh, kind of uh, check and, and identify a, a particular condition of composition if it appears in the photograph to the right. Uh, it also combines not only this kind of uh, assessment of what they've already learned, but it also introduces a new idea, in this case the idea of a frame. And so the, the idea here is that uh, we can, as, as you noticed in the diagram where we showed the, the problem progression, uh, we present a new example, we apply what we've already learned, and then we present new information about this example. And this is a case where we do that. We go through the whole course uh, in, to make sure that we have assessment opportunities throughout the course. Um, in addition, uh, we want to be able to collect data. We advocate in this particular, um, in one of the examples that we use in first principles is that we want to create a functional prototype, something that can actually be used to try out uh, with uh, potential students before we create our final design. Uh, the illustration uses PowerPoint and shows how the PowerPoint can be used. This particular slide shows that by adding some simple macros to PowerPoint, we can actually collect data as we in, as we try out our student, our try out our prototype with our students. And one of the steps is to actually try the prototype out to gather some data to see if, in fact, we have created effective, efficient instruction. Another thing that's, that, that we've talked about here is functional prototypes. Uh, in PowerPoint, there are some really powerful things we can use with slide masters. Uh, in PowerPoint 2.10 on the, on the PC, uh, these slide masters can have uh, animation and other kinds of interaction attached to them so that we can actually create templates for students to use. Uh, or for designers to use. And so one of the other things we advocate is design templates. Uh, there's some indication in the book about how to create a template. It's illustrated using PowerPoint. Uh, it indicates how to add animation and macros to do that. So there's also in the book then some additional things about uh, pulling uh, these things together and, and illustrating how to do it with a particular tool, although other tools could be used. I hope that this gives you a kind of a quick overview uh, of the uh, of the content of this book. I would certainly uh, welcome your contacting me at the uh, at the URL or at the at the email that's uh, indicated here. You may also contact Pfeiffer concerning the publication. They indicate this book should be available in October of 2012. Thank you for listening. I hope that you are able to acquire first principles of instruction and most important I hope that will improve the quality of the instruction that you design or select for your organization. Thanks for listening.